And I hasten to add that I've never really contemplated going into frontline politics. Um, so my, my intervention is not really about political participation from a personal perspective, um, but more to do with accountability. The accountability vibe that has been raised, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, but what is even more important is to strengthen the institutions mm -hmm. that are actually set up to provide that accountability. National Human Rights Commission, the courts, and other oversight bodies. As a citizenry, I think we can do more to support. Um, I've never really seen the peaceful protest in support of the NHRC, for example, to say, OK, National Human Rights Commission has made a recommendation, hypothetically perhaps, to the police, and they have failed to comply. So in fact, we as concerned citizens or CSO were coming out to protest in support of that. Um, not that it needs to go that far, but perhaps just to highlight the fact that it is really important for us as a citizen uh, to, to give more support to these oversight institutions that are actually created. Because they need us. They need us. Um, it is one thing to have a good legal framework and with all the powers that you are given by an act of parliament. But, but really, in order to ensure timely and effective implementation of those provisions, um, we need all hands on deck. Uh, the National Human Rights Commission is there to protect and promote human rights. The courts are there to interpret the law and provide redress also for human rights violations. So we need to do more to strengthen them. Um, I teach constitutional law at the university. And in fact, I tell my students routinely that uh, the 1997 constitution is not as terrible as we all think. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the provisions that deal with fundamental rights and freedoms, section 18 to 33 and section 36 of section 5, it's as good as it gets. You know, anywhere else in the world. The problem was that the people who were tasked with respecting, honoring, and implementing those provisions were the ones violating it routinely. So it got to a point where in the citizen they could not really draw the line between what the Constitution says and what is actually happening in practice. So they see someone being tortured, someone being detained for seven days, they say, wow, Gambia has a terrible Constitution. To the average person, they say. Whereas that constitution actually says you cannot detain someone beyond 72 hours mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without releasing them or bringing them before a court of law. So I think we can have a very nice constitution, nice legal provisions, but in the absence of political will mm -hmm. to ensure timely and effective implementation. Uh, as Lord Denning would say, the document will be reduced to a mere pious declaration. So it will say all the right things on paper, but in practice, not, not a lot would be happening. So I think it's important, it's important, and it's one of the things that could actually help us to ensure that we avoid conflicts in our, in our countries and in our societies. Because I, I remember my first job as a lawyer was in Sierra Leone, in the UN Special Court there. And one of the recurring themes behind the war was the fact that the majority of the population had actually lost confidence in the establishment to settle their disputes appropriately and amicably. So you go to a stage where you feel that if you have a problem, you have to take matters into your own hands. That's the only form of redress you can get. Because you think, OK, if I go to the police, they will be compromised. If I go to the courts, they will be compromised. Civil society has been uh, is completely broken down, et cetera, et cetera. So you are left in a very state of despondency. And you feel that, OK, now I'll just take the plunge. If you steal my loaf of bread, I'll come for it. If you don't give it to me, I'll get my knife out and we sort it out there and then. Not that we should encourage that, and not that it should be condoned, but sometimes um, um, we create a situation that makes things like that um, almost in, 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 inevitable, inevitable. And again, we do not wish to condone or legitimize the issue of coup in any way. I mean, I always tell my students that coup d'etat is terrible. There can never be any good from a coup d'etat. No matter how bad the problems are, we can always look for solutions. But coup d'etat is a no-go area. But then again, you look at the root causes behind some of these coup d'etats. Um, again, people, they're there. They're human beings. Um, everybody wants a better quality of life. Everybody wants social economic progress. And if you vote for a candidate or for a politician, now there is a contract. There is a contract. They offered and you accepted. Now, what they offered and you accepted, you, you really want to see that being translated into action during the course of uh, their, their mandate. Now, if you don't see that, 
and you knock all doors and nothing is happening, sometimes you can be tempted to either take matters into your own hands or the military or the law enforcement establishments can be tempted to take matters into their, into their own hands. Not that that can be excused or condoned, but, but sometimes it is, it is inevitable. It is, it is inevitable. But at the issue, I think we should all find you know, who they task. Um, I don't think there is anything good that can come from it. No matter how bad, no matter how bad the situation is, um, we should always be able to dialogue and look for a way out, even in the most difficult um, of, 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 of circumstances. And then the other thing, of course, with politicians, um, I remember having this observation that I, I lived in the UK before, and MPs would have what is called surgery. Routine surgeries they would have. They would go back to their constituencies, engage their constituents. Um, but here, I, I don't see a lot of that actually happening. Um, so, and it's a very dangerous part to take to assume that because I voted for you, for the next five years you can speak on my behalf without consulting. I think it's important. Each time there is a bill presented before you, go back and consult your people. Don't don't take that vote as a blanket authorization for you to vote on their behalf on anything that comes and say, well, they voted for me. So implicitly, whenever I vote, they are also in approval. I think it's important that there is constant and sustained engagement between the parliamentarians and their people. Because otherwise, contrary to popular view, the Constitution contains some very strong accountability mechanisms at the disposal of your constituents. There is what is called a vote of recall. We can recall you. If they think you are so incompetent and inefficient that it has gone beyond bounds, there is a provision in the Constitution that empowers them to actually recall you as a, as a, as a, representative, as a representative. So I think the accountability mechanisms need to be strengthened. Um, sometimes I also feel very sorry for our uh, parliamentarians here. They probably massively unpaid. I mean, I, I live in Nairobi, in Kenya, uh, and in Kenya, I think their parliamentarians are probably amongst the highest paid yeah, in the whole world. They, were, they used to be the highest yeah, paid. Yes, amongst the highest paid in the whole world. I don't think our own parliamentarians get a fraction of what they're being paid. And now, this brings to the, for the issue of managing expectations. Mm -hmm. Now, people expect that if you are the parliamentarian, when there is a Gente, uh, Gente means a naming ceremony, christening, um, you have to go and give something. When there is a funeral, you are expected to contribute. Mm -hmm. When there are other social activities within the community, you are expected to contribute. Rightly or wrongly, this is part of our social fabric and expectations. Now, I think the time has arrived for us to really consider the conditions of service of our parliamentarians by way of improving it, um, making sure that they are well paid. Um, I don't even think they have vehicles allocated to them by, by the state. Um, and making sure that also we give them some sort of a, I don't know if we call it a trust fund or a development fund of some sort. Yes, yes, a token to each of them so that whenever the, the need arises, they can dip their hands into that uh, for, the, for, the, for the benefit of the community. And this is why I was a bit disappointed when I saw them actually asking for a loan instead of really voting to actually improve their own conditions of service, which I think they would have done that it's been. Um, because they are the lawmakers after all. Mm. They are the lawmakers after all. But I think that's also one factor that we need to look into. In as much as we want to saddle them with a lot of responsibility and strengthen the accountability mechanisms, I think we must also strengthen their conditions of service. Mm -hmm. And this, I believe, would, would make a big difference.